Welcome to Cannabis Health News Magazine. We're here today live on the uh, telephone with Dennis Perone. Dennis Perone uh, helped with Proposition Nine. Sorry, with uh, Proposition Two Fifteen, and um, quite a few other things. He is one of the founders, I will have to say, of the marijuana movement. He worked with Harvey Milk. He was friends with Robert Randall, Peter McWilliams and a whole list of very, very important figures in our movement of the cannabis industry. So Dennis, thank you very much for joining us from Hawaii today. Yes, I'm in Hawaii now, aloha. Aloha. So Dennis, um, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in the industry um, in Colorado, across the United States, and um, before we get into a lot of the things that uh, we really want to talk about in terms of, I definitely want to get into a Peter Williams uh, tribute conversation here, but uh, could you tell us a little bit about the rescheduling at the federal level that you're trying to work on and the support that you have. I understand that you have about 168 congressmen of the United States that are in support of this. Yes, if you add up all the states that legalize medical marijuana, you get 168 congressmen, and there are more states legalizing it this year uh, in addition to the ones that already have. So 168 congressmen, we need 227. We have to get marijuana rescheduled. That's the big problem right now. Right now, the federal hand of the DEA is attacking us, and we are powerless to stop them. We have to, we have to get the marijuana rescheduled, and scheduled to schedule or off schedule. Off schedule. And, I like uh, the idea of off schedule. I, I'm a big fan of repeal myself. Yes, I am too. Because I don't believe it should be on the schedule. It's an herb. It's a natural herb. There's no, no. No one's ever died from it. No one's ever going to die from it. And uh, so we try to work on that. We have to work on a federal level. While we're working on other states, we get more states, more states to join on. We have 13. We get 14. We get 15. Eventually, we get half the country. And that was that is the key. 51, 51% of Congress, and we win. Who are you working yeah. with? On, sorry, who are you working on what? with uh, this rescheduling initiative? Well, I'm, I'm working on my. I'm working this myself. I'm great. I'm determined to get marijuana rescheduled or off the schedule. So I have a little campaign. This is my own campaign. I I, I wrote I wrote to congressman. I told them how they that despite whether they voted on it or didn't vote on it, they are representatives and they have to carry our message to Congress. And I, many have written back and many will write and many responded in an affirmative. Even if they didn't vote for it, they will carry our message to Congress. Well, so I'm definitely sorry about that. I'm definitely going to contribute uh, writing a letter and, and getting people out here in Colorado to support what you're doing and write letters or send emails to our congressmen. Um, Dennis, you know, one of the things that you bring up consistently in your message is that marijuana is medical use. And when you say that, you you really come from the perspective that marijuana can benefit everybody, just like food is medicine. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, your perspective of medical marijuana and marijuana in use? Yeah, well, I believe there's a medical component to all use of marijuana. And uh, you know, some people that smoke it, they don't, they don't feel anything. Those people, not, it's not a medicine for them. But those that smoke it, and then all of a sudden they discover a different consciousness, or, uh, some kind of feeling that in the inside, those people are used for medical. And there is a medical component to all of it. If you use it, what are you using it for? What what happens to you? And right. I think you know, everybody will find out that what they, what's happening to them is a medical reason. Even if they're just depression, they, they, people use Prozac. They're not using Prozac for fun. Right. They're using it for a reason. And uh, so there's a medical component. Right? So that's why I feel if you use marijuana, it's a medical reason. If you're, if you're using it for a medical reason, there's no reason you'd be punished. I mean, people use medicine. It's not everyone uses the med same medicine. But they're not punished for using their medicine. And so, if it is true that all use is medical, why is it on Schedule 1? Why is it misplaced on the, on the, uh, the drug, drug schedule? And it is, it is a medicine. It's on, it's on the scheduling as a medicine. And they, deny, they don't deny it as a medicine. Of course, it's on the schedule for medicine, but it's re you're wrong, wrong, wrongly placed. It's not in the schedule one. It should be schedule five or six, or even off the schedule. Mm -hmm. Aspirin is not on the schedule. It, no one denied that aspirin is a medicine. 
And that's something that is acknowledged also in the 1961, um, I think it's the uh, single convention on narcotics, if I remember right. And it states in there that uh, marijuana can be used as a medicine, uh, if I recall correctly. And so this is a really important issue. Today, uh, there's a lot of paradox with what's happening. We have John Walsh of the United States Attorney Office, Attorney General's Office, uh, essentially attacking both Colorado and California. Uh, Colorado right now, they're chipping away at uh, 22 dispensaries uh, last month and now 25 this month. And they're going to keep picking at us until they tear us apart. It's that divide and conquer technique. Now, that said, we do have a DA here, Stan Garnett, who was the same DA who prosecuted me in my case. However, he's come 180 degrees. He now stands up for our industry. He has written a letter to John Walsh telling him to back off. And so we're starting to see a little bit more support from DAs around the country. Dennis, what's your experience with the political environment um, in, in what you've been dealing with in California? Well, we're all afraid of the feds. Let's get real. The feds are all so powerful. They, they do what they want. They don't ask anybody. The local DA, he's powerless. He's powerless to stop these people. Right. The DA has his own agenda. And you, you can scream all you want. Right. You can cry all you want. We can call restaurants. Until we, until we get to defang the DEA, we're not going to get anywhere. So we have to concentrate on the federal level because they will just come in, run all over us, and put us in jail. And they have done it, and they, do, they will do it. They'll continue to do it. The DEA has its own agenda. They've increased... They've increased that imprisonment, that rate of incarceration, since uh, Obama's come into office, it seems like. We, yeah, but it's not, it's not Obama's fault. We could we don't misplace blame on Obama. So it's more yeah. just a residual yeah. effect from uh, the prior uh, office holders, if you will, Bush, if you will. Well, it's also, it's also the DEA has its own agenda. Mm-hmm. It is funded by Congress. It has a jo- job to do, and they're doing their job. And they don't. And they always say, I'm doing their job. Do, they don't really have any oversight. It seems like they uh, claim that things are illegal and they go off on their own um, path of busting people. Of course, this, this uh, attack, I'll call it, on Colorado and California is something that doesn't seem to be not only legal, but it's not morally right, and it doesn't seem to be what the people of the United States want. What they have their, their assignment. Their assignment is to eradicate marijuana, to stop it where they can, because it's just on the Schedule One. It's right next to the heroin. And so they have their agenda. They have to do this. That is in their, their, in, it's their job to do. Until we change that, that's what they're going to do. And, uh, and despite what Obama and the Justice Department wants, they're going to do what they want. So, do what they, and so, so if we look at um, a lot of uh, what's happened in the the uh, past of the history, or sorry, the history of the cannabis movement, the marijuana movement, you've had a lot of influence, and you know a lot of people who have had major influence in the industry as well. Um, all of you collectively have brought us to where we are today, and um, we really need to, I think, learn from what you've done. We need to learn from people like Robert Randall, his book. I just finished reading his uh, marijuana book, and it's fantastic. It's really about how he um, addressed the federal government and was able to win his case to use medical marijuana. Uh, you also worked with Harvey Milk in um, his political campaign in uh, San Francisco. Can you tell us, <clears throat> you know, Coming full circle, as I mentioned, all these people, can you please tell us a little bit about a little bit more about um, Peter McWilliams? Now, Peter is somebody that very few people know of, and when I learned about him, I was absolutely amazed. I've read a couple of his books, and um, he is also somebody who is re- integral in the cannabis movement. And I'd like you to share your story about Peter, if you could. Well, uh, I met Peter during the campaign for Prop 215, a little bit before the campaign for Prop 215. But what happened is, Peter was a libertarian. He felt felt that you have a right to do this. And he was a pot user, he loved his pot. And unfortunately, he had HIV, mm-hmm. and AIDS. And in the later stages of his life, he was using marijuana and got busted. And that's, that's, that's the saga of Peter. But he was ordered by the judge to not to use marijuana. And because of that, he, he he died. He was in a wheelchair. He had died 
choking on his own vomit. He tried. He used marijuana to keep down food and to to stop the nausea associated with the the HIV, and he died. Uh, I have to say, I, I think the judge should be held for murder. I was going to say the that doesn't. It sounds like it is murder. It, it basically, the government told him not to use this medicine that was keeping him alive, and he died in his own vomit uh, in his wheelchair. I believe it. That the judge should be held culpable, but that's that's another story. Mm-hmm. Peter is a hero because he died for what he believed, and uh, I believe he was murdered. But that's another story. And Harvey Milk, a lot of our heroes are dead now. But but they died doing what they also, believed in, and they've they've helped us all as a as a community and as a a human human race. They've really brought us forward. And, you know, in his death. I have to honor him because he did move us ahead. He inspired a lot of people to to, to keep fighting. And uh, unfortunately, he did it with his life. And you can't get a bigger sacrifice than that. Yeah, and Harvey yeah. Milk was a, Milk. really gave his life as well, I, I think, um, in a very tragic a tragic death. Um, but I think in, in, in um, that action, he influenced also a lot of people. Um, I really, I really was amazed um, after reading some of his work, and uh, was fortunate enough to also see the the film, um, you know, last year or a couple of years back, and um, it's something that opened my eyes to a lot of things. Number one, uh, taught me about who Harvey Milk was. It started to really make me more interested about who you were, um, but it also started to really teach me that you and Harvey Milk and Peter McWilliams and Robert Randall have given us tools to take the discrimination that you were burdened with and still are. We all are still, I think, in a a very interesting situation in the United States because it seems like prejudice has actually increased. Um, I'm a disabled person and I get a lot of um, uh, really second class uh, citizen remarks from people just because I've got wheels attached to me, if you will. So, because I'm gay, I also get to see him on a similar thing. Mm-hmm. And even in the movement, uh, some people will look down upon my me because I am gay. But Harvey Milk was a, was a man that wanted to include everybody in this American dream. And he's inspired me to give me hope that we can do this. And I, I, I'm in the movie, I don't know if you've seen it. You said you saw the movie. I'm in the movie, and the guy smoked, always smoking the joint, rolling the joint. And uh, I'm, a, I'm at a rally where Harvey's trying to get elected, and he has a marijuana. Smoking, he said. He said in his speech, "We've got to legalize marijuana. We've got to." That was 1977, mm-hmm. and uh, when he died, I, I, I took up his mantle. So we have to legalize marijuana. We have to legalize gay rights. We have to, we have to do so many things in this country to complete the American dream. And so it's Harvey I keep fighting, and it's people like Bob Randall and Peter McWilliams who gave their life for what they believed. That I, I will. If it will be an honor for me to give my life. For what I believe, but I I, I, I don't want to die. I don't want to. Die. I'm not. Gonna, I am going to die someday, but I will die fighting for this because I believe I believe marijuana is a medicine that can help society and help everybody. And so I'm willing to just fight until I die to, for this reason. And I, I believe you. A lot of people believe that it is wrong. It's illegal. It's wrong. It's being denied people from medicine. It's wrong. They are very very literally killing people. For this, for this war, and uh, we have to we have to work methodically together to to limit this war. Like we had a Proposition 19 in, uh, in California two years ago, and I was against it because it was restricting marijuana more than more than we have to get together, realize our dream, and let's put it on paper. Let people vote for it. If you want to vote for it, let people get you get people to vote for this. But with this going going all go off on tangents in 19 that the 19 was restricting marijuana we get together let's get get our stuff together and cohesively fight this to fit the federal government I believe they have to do it in Congress right now 168 votes 227 is the magic number we have other states joining on let's do it we can do it so it's that unity that you bring up and that's something that uh, we've been been really trying to focus on in Colorado, let alone across the United States. Uh, there are a lot of different groups out there, national organizations and so on and so forth, but let alone those, we still have a lot of infighting in our own state for whatever reason. And 
after watching what happened with Prop 19 and listening to you speak and reading your work, I really think that um, the message was was uh, construed. It was misunderstood. I also think people misunderstood what the um, what Prop 19 was going to do. And I'm starting to see that here. A lot of people are starting to misunderstand, for example, um, the initiative, uh, I should say Amendment 64, which would treat marijuana or cannabis like alcohol. And um, so we have a lot of this quote unquote infighting. One of the things that I keep throwing out there, and you just said it, is we need to work together to fight the bigger picture. All these other issues are really moot at this point. We have people in jail, we have people being shot on the street uh, or in their front door. And um, people are dying for this, not only for those of us who are fighting in this industry, but people who need the medicine. Um, are dying. My stepfather died of cancer. My stepmom has cancer right now, and they don't live in a state where it's where there's medical marijuana. And so it's it's a moral duty. I, I really feel like I've put myself aside, and it's about the message. I'm willing to sacrifice anything to help everybody else out there. And and you are one of the people is that that have, have uh, encouraged me. So thank you very much, Dennis. I appreciate that. Well, thank you, Jason. You're encouraging me because it is our moral duty to do this. And you talk about industry. Forget the industry. I don't care about the industry. Mm. I care about the moral duty we have to our brothers and our sisters and to our nation to legalize this stuff. It's a moral imperative. Right now they have an initiative in, in Washington State that equates marijuana with drunk driving. I'm going to go totally against it. We have one here, too, the DUID bill. Yeah. It's awful. It's awful. If it, marijuana gets equated with alcohol, we're all over. We cannot win. We cannot let that happen. Marijuana has nothing to do with alcohol. If anything, it'll stop people from drinking, and it'll save us from alcohol. That's a, v- a killer. It's a kill chug. Dennis, that's a very powerful statement. Um, there is no comparison with cannabis and alcohol. In fact, uh, you bring up something very important is it can help stop people from drinking and not just stop them but it's really about a choice i don't like personally i don't want to drink anymore i find cannabis uh, does what it needs to do for me in terms of my my mind my body um, my mental behavior so on and so forth it's very important that we fight these things i don't know where it's coming from who these two of these people but they may be well-meaning a little misguided they may, not, may, may actually be the enemy Right. I mean, I don't really know who these people are. And that's a to that's a that tough one to deal with because a lot of times people will say, oh, you're the enemy, but it might be that they're just misguided or don't quite understand. So we're in this really interesting place where we're trying to bring everyone together. But, of course, some of those people may be outsiders, if you will. Um, Dennis, exactly. <clears throat> excuse me. Dennis, um, this is something that is crucial. Um, the amount of momentum behind legalization right now is massive. I see Barry Frank and Ron Paul, if I might recall right, also have a bill uh, at the federal level to eliminate criminal prosecution for cannabis users. Um, now, what I find fascinating is a lot of people come and talk to me and they say, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, um, or in your case, you know, back from the quote, from Harvey Milk in 1977, it's been 35 years. A lot of people say, wow, you know, I never thought this would happen or we've been fighting this for so long. How do you see what's happening today? Do you think that this is going to change everything? Are we at the point where all the cards are on the table? Or is just this is this another step that we're just going through? Like, um, has ha, we've all been in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, so on and so forth. You know, I believe, Jason, I believe that we're reaching critical mass. And I believe marijuana, every, every, you see the roadmap, and it's in front of you, marijuana will be legal. It will, in, perhaps not in my lifetime, but it will be legal. It's going that way. We cannot drop the ball this time. We've dropped the ball too many times. Now we have to be consistent and keep our message on, keep our message on going. Marijuana is medicine. It can help people. And I think people agree with us. They understand it. They understand it as a medicine. And then Americans are not going to deny people a medicine right. that helps them. They all have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. They know. So we keep our message to keep our message chasing medicine. We, we need it. Our, our people need it. Our country needs it. Besides the right, re, re, you know, the, there is no recreational marijuana. Right. They, I agree with they, you. They I agree they with you completely. 
It's yeah, um, they use it to demonize us and to, to display us our message. All use of medical, and it is a medicine, and we have to be rescheduled. It's interesting because we also have the um, patent from the Health and Human Services Department from the United States from 2003 that also says that this can uh, kill cancer, remove tumors, address Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, diabetes, ADHD. I mean, we know this stuff. And what I find fascinating is what you're pointing out is very critical. We're at the stage where we're denying children with cancer a medicine that can cure that cancer, as we've seen with Cash Hyde in Montana, who had the brain tumor, for example. So that said, we see, and you referenced this, we have this momentum, we have this this push. We are now past that 50% mark of wanting to legalize marijuana in the United States and past, I think, the 80% mark in wanting to you. Uh, legitimize marijuana use for medical use only. That said, um, we also have a voting population of less than 15% in the United States. And so there's a big problem we're facing, I think, right now. We need to get people to participate in this system and do things like Craig Bresch is in California. He's been uh, gathering all the petitions out there and getting rid of the bans uh, in a lot of the counties, from what I understand. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Craig at all. Um, so he, he actually sits on the board with, uh, with myself and Stickman for Overgrow the Government, and uh, we also have a radio show called Overgrow the Radio. But um, Craig has been phenomenal. I had a chance to sit down with him a couple weeks ago down in Pueblo, and so he's taught me a lot. He's taught a lot of people of how to make this happen. And then, of course, you are very well-informed and, and have done these things before. What would you tell somebody out there, a new listener, who wants to do something and make a difference? What would you tell them that they can do and help? Well, I would tell them to, get, to personalize this. Personalize mar- medical marijuana. Understand that what was used for and personalize it and bring a personal message to the people. And I did, I did, I did with Prop 215. I mean, I started the cannabis clubs I didn't do it for money. I did it for did it for a point. I wanted to make a point. Here are the people that are using marijuana. I want to dehumanize dehumanize the people that are using it. And so, humanize the people. Humanize your message and and get it get it out there. And sometimes, uh, like we don't have to do what I did. I I did an extraordinary thing. I, I took I started a club in the middle of a war on drugs for sick and dying people. You don't have to do that for, but you have to humanize our message, to show people, show the people who are they, who they are, and uh, keep it, be consistent and be, keep it up. Do not drop the ball. Just, uh, and on a local level, you wanna, okay, there's, there's initiatives you can do, there's, there's things we can do, and keep our message, write your congressman, do things like that, we, we all know what to do, and, uh, I think they just humanize your message and personalize it, and I think that we are, we will win in the end. Dennis, thank you very much for that. That's exactly what I've been encouraging everybody to do: is really bring it back home to our personal stories, and that's what's gotten me motivated. After my trial, facing eight years in prison, losing my son, losing my uh, my job, uh, my residence, all because, even though I won my case, but all because of the accusation of marijuana. And unfortunately, I've been put in a position where I'm in this really weird gray zone. I may have won my trial, but I still uh, am not allowed to teach at an accredited school anymore, for example. And you bring up something that's really important, Dennis. A lot of, us, a lot of people out there see us as cannabis users um, or sick people or disabled or what have you. But we also are people. We have beliefs and we have skills a lot of us are professionals. I am amazed, actually, at how many professionals use cannabis and how few people are actually fit that stereotype. Um, I worked on the insurance litigation with the uh, World Trade Center, for example. I just met a gentleman the other day who's an astrophysicist. Uh, I met another day, a uh, gentleman the other day who uh, is a leaching and detection expert for radiation um, contamination. And so... <laughs> Uh, that said, you We're really everywhere. you bring up a big thing. We are everywhere. We are everyone. And it's just like the game, the mystery, the case. Hmm. We are everywhere, and we are everyone. And you cannot 
you know, isolate us. You cannot stereotype us. We are everywhere. We are everyone. And uh, personalize our message. Show them we, we, we are we human beings. We are part of this country. And that to, to isolate us and to humanize us is wrong. And so, uh, our message is getting across. We are going to win. We are, we are going, going to win. We are going to win. And, you know, I really appreciate you um, creating the, the reference to the uh, gay rights movement because um, I think it's ironic that it started simultaneously, if you will. Um, the message is very similar uh, in, a, in a profound way. We are coming out of the closet in terms of, you know, a lot of us grew in the closet. And so right. it's... it's <laughs> I'm, I feel honored to to use um, some of the tools that you have provided us in your experiences, and um, I really hope to hear uh, what you're working on succeeds. Um, I really believe that you're going to see the legalization in your lifetime. I think we're all going to see that very shortly. There are a couple things that um, I want to throw out there real, real quick, and that is, why aren't the patients, why aren't the individuals out there suing the government, whether it's state or federal government, for interfering with medical access? Oh, a, lot of, a lot of patients are weak and they're, they don't feel really empowered. And uh, that's part of the process, to try to disempower people, to make them feel weaker, that they can't do anything. But they can. Yes. They can do something. They can demand something. And someday our voices will be heard. And it's just starting now. It's starting now and it can it, it happen. And it will happen. And uh, I believe everyone that, that has an illness or something that marijuana is, is measured, got to speak out. we got to speak out, even at the peril of our own selves. We've got to understand that this is a, a battle that's going on for generations, and it's got to, we've got to win. Dennis, your country. Dennis, this is about our country. This is about America, and this is about the rights and duty of American citizens. We fought for this country in 1775 and won, and uh, I think we need to think about what we're doing here and what our duty is. This is a country about individual thoughts and rights and expression, and right now, unfortunately, it seems like we're moving toward this uh, single message, message, and we all need to be this one entity instead of our own identity. So... That said, I hope that um, we can get you back on the show. I hope to hear more news Appreciate about what you. you're doing. So, Dennis, yes. thank you again for joining us at Cannabis Health News Magazine. Thank you for having, you for having me, Jason. I thank you very much, and uh, keep, keep on fighting. Thank you. You too, and uh, I, de- I know we're going to talk again, Dennis. So be well, enjoy yes. Hawaii, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you for joining us on Cannabis Health News Magazine today with Dennis Perone. We were very fortunate to listen to him from Hawaii. It was actually 9 a.m. when we called him this morning, and uh, it was kind of interesting. We were trying to reach Julia, or sorry, excuse me, from uh, Julia from Peter's page, and unfortunately, we weren't able to get a hold of her. So what we're going to do is uh, go ahead and give her a buzz and get her on for the next half hour. Come on back after we hear a word from our sponsors. Thank you very much. Are you a runner? Are you a runner who supports marijuana legalization? Run on Grass is a group of athletes actively seeking to change our marijuana laws. We speak the truth about cannabis, bringing the message through our feet to new ears. Check out runongrass.com to find out more about us, our events, and how to join up or how to sponsor a runner. If you're in the Denver area, please join us for runs or start a group in your area. Running not your thing? Any sport can do it on grass. Runongrass.com. The law offices of Vets and Maintenance Mats provide criminal defense, medical marijuana defense, and advice about setting up and running medical marijuana centers, optional premises, cultivation operations, and infused product manufacturing businesses throughout Colorado. With offices in Denver and Aspen, we can offer assistance throughout the entire state of Colorado. Give us a call at 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Or visit us online at warrenetson.com. California's Attorney General has determined that the Repeal Cannabis Prohibition Act will save hundreds of millions of dollars from our overburdened justice system while creating hundreds of millions in new tax revenues from new sustainable jobs and industries that are friendly to our environment. But we can't do it without your help. We are seeking your donations to get on the ballot. Please go to repealcannabisprohibition.org to learn more about how you can help. It's time to end the war on cannabis in Hemp in California. It's time to end the madness. Paid for by Sensible California's Incorporated. 
Yo, who got it better than me? Better line on the block, rolling VIP. Sick whip, thick rims, fat rocks, I got them. Shining like a superstar from top to bottom. You need a sugar daddy, I'm the Mac. And if you need a dollar, holla, cause I got a whole stack. What? Rolling VIP. What? Rolling VIP. Better night. What? Fries. Life comes at you fast. Thank you. A nationwide annuity could guarantee you income for life. Nationwide is on the side. Experience the healing power of flowers at the 2011 Best Meds Competition winner in Colorado Springs. Canna Caregivers off North Academy Boulevard and the Canna Center on Power South of Constitution. Call us at 719-597-6685 or 719-597-9333. Sarah's Medicated Teas. With over 50,000 tea bags sold, Sarah's Medicated Teas have quickly become the most popular and most effective way to medicate without smoking. Our tea bags are made with loose leaf tea and fine hash keef. We separate into sativa, indica, hybrid, and kush medicine bases in one third and one full gram strength. Our keef infusion process has a consistent measured dose in each bag. Sarah's Medicated Teas come in 20 flavors. Enjoy them hot or over ice. Sarah's Medicated Teas can be found in 80 MMJ centers across the state of Colorado. Sarah's Medicated Teas, when you need to medicate, it's tea time. I'm Gary Johnson, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio, and I want to say, talk it up, Colorado. Welcome to Cannabis Health News Magazine. We're here today with Julia from PeterMcWilliams.org. Julia is a very big supporter, a loving person, and has wonderful energy. She says she's shy, but I never really saw that side of her. So welcome to our show today, Julia. Thank you very much for joining us. I am shy, thank you. <laughs> I, when I'm on stage, I'm different. But thank you for having me so much. I really am honored that Cannabis Health News Magazine is having me on, Jason. And I just heard about your award, and I think that's so awesome. Congratulations. You guys deserve it. Thank you, you very awesome much. Work. Yes. Thank you very much, Julia. That that uh, award goes to iCannabis Radio, the network that we uh, operate under. We've got about 10 different radio shows uh, that we're working on. So That is great. So congratulations to all 10 of you. That is super. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of amazing people putting their um, time and effort, uh, 24 hours a day almost some of these days, into the studio, you know, cleaning the floors, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, wow, yeah. Plugging wires in. Yes. So Julia, you've um, you've been working on a wonderful, wonderful thing um, oh, over the last. It's been about a year now, maybe a little longer. Well, yeah, I started. I officially started January fourth, two thousand ten, um, with a MySpace page to, uh, for Peter McWilliams. And who is Peter it's McWilliams? A, a lot of people uh, that I talk to say they've never heard of him. And it does take a little bit of an introduction to reveal how special of a person he is. Peter McWilliams was a lot of things. He was a New York Times bestselling author. In fact, five of his books went straight to the New York Times bestseller list. Um, he self-published over 40 books all on his own. Even one of them, 20 publishers had turned down and then he said, I'm going to publish this myself. And he did all of that. He was a poet. He published his first poem when he was 17. Uh, he was a photographer. <laughs> and in later years, he became a outspoken medical cannabis activist. And he was also a libertarian later in life. And... Uh, so here's a lot of real quick, mm -hmm. just to jump in there. You've brought up quite a few things. Um, I've read some of his work. I've read some of his poetry. It is very good. Uh, a huh. lot of uh, I've I've watched some of his videos. There's some videos online that have come across where you can listen to him speak. If you're interested, do a search on YouTube yeah. for Peter McWilliams. Yeah. Yes, it's under We Remember Peter. If you don't mind me plugging that, Thank please, you. please. We Remember <laughs> Peter. Dot no, it's just youtube.com slash okay. we remember Peter, yes. Thank you. So it's, he's got his own channel. Um, yes. So Peter <laughs> Peter um, also was a big supporter of medical marijuana, and he got very um, connected with the medical marijuana movement. Um, we spoke with Dennis Perone earlier, 
I love Dennis. He's a wonderful man, and I feel no, very. He really is. I feel very hi, fortunate. Dennis, I know you can't hear can't hear me live, but hi, Dennis. <laughs> we'll make sure he hears you tomorrow when we broadcast for sure. Now, Dennis oh, um, shared some some uh, of his story about Peter and meeting him um, just a few years, unfortunately, before he passed away, and they worked on Prop Two Fifteen together. Yes, they did, and that that was so important for the medical cannabis community. It was so important. I believe that it helped keep Peter alive. It really did. And Peter, um, um, unfortunately, was diagnosed with HIV at one point. He was diagnosed with both AIDS and non-Hodgkin lymphoma um, in March 1996, and um, he found that actually smoking cannabis was the one thing that kept him from feeling so nauseous and it kept his food down. He hadn't actually smoked. A lot of people think Peter just smoked all throughout his life. No, that's not the case. He hadn't smoked since college. Mm-hmm. and um, But he discovered it again because he was big into health and he wanted some way to keep those meds down. He tried all the meds under the sun, too, that the docs gave him. And, and, it was just awful. Nothing was staying down. And those are all the, the common pharmaceuticals that uh, we're all familiar with, those of us who have been through the medical industry. Oh, yes, sir. And, you know, another thing about Peter is he had suffered from depression for almost 40 years without even knowing it. Mm. And um, he found that St. John's wort helped him. He also... He wrote he a book about that, t- didn't he? Yes, sir. Yes. He co-authored it. Thank you for asking about that. Mm-hmm. With Harold Bloomfield, it's called How to Heal Depression. And I know this is important to bring up because a lot of people in the cannabis community have issues with depression. Thank you, Julia, and, for, for bringing this up. I really think that this is a key issue. Oh, Sorry to you. jump in there. Well, I, I'm honored that you would care, Jason, because unfortunately a lot of people want me to focus on only the pot or the you know the mm-hmm. activism, and they don't get the other stuff Peter did. So I'm just so honored you would allow me to bring that up about him too. Depression is something that affects many, many people in the United States. Uh, and it's interesting because it seems as though the United States actually has a very high uh, density per capita of depression uh, compared to the rest of the world. We are oh, yeah. a very interesting country to say the least. And I think um, personally, health is, is my center focus. That's my uh, connection between everything. And so it is a very important issue to me. I think that all, all of us at one time or another have probably suffered from some form of depression, whether or not we knew it. Um, and oh, yeah. we probably have some people around us who suffer from it. Now, Julia, um, I know that a lot of people in the medical cannabis movement or a lot of the patients out there do use cannabis to help alleviate their depression. Now, that said, we got to be careful because it's not just cannabis in general. There's all sorts of different strains and varieties of yeah of percentages of THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, or CBD, cannabidiol. Um, Now, what I find really interesting, though, is that you are not a cannabis user. And a lot of people, a lot of public people, or a lot of people out there say, wow, you know, you guys all like supporting cannabis because you use it, you're whatever. They start to use those stereotypical references. Now, Julia, do you mind talking about that a little bit in terms of what your experience is Before you learned about Peter McWilliams uh, with cannabis and how Peter may have um, given you a little bit more information about medical cannabis. Well, I discovered Peter in 2009, which was almost 10 years after he died. And his book, You Can't Afford the Luxury of a Negative Thought, Mm -hmm. is a really good book because it helps people with depression. It helps people that are fighting for their lives. Like people that I know, like Tanya Davis in Ohio, who mm-hmm. said, you know, yeah, autoimmune, Tanya. yeah, problem. And Adam Asenberg, too, who's out in Colfax. You know, all these patients. I mean, uh, this book is an amazing book. And, um, and I discovered it. And then I wanted to thank Peter because it touched me so much. So I went online and discovered he had died. And I was very upset because I, I learned he died only at the age of 50. And then I learned how he died. So I approached this whole thing, I guess, a little bit differently than others in the cannabis community might have. Julia, because, real quick, I don't mean to, oh. to interrupt. I, I actually do. Um, I do want to touch on something here. And because you mentioned, um, it, you mentioned something about how Peter died. 
and when you learned about how he died. And that's something that is extremely upsetting to me. Um, I almost see it, and I'll agree with Dennis Perone on this, that it is murder. It is the responsibility of our government um, for what happened with Peter. Peter died uh, by choking from choking on his own vomit, and that was a result of not being able to access his medical marijuana. Yeah, there are different reports. Some say that he died of a heart attack, and, and some say, oh, it's definitely vomit, but the way I look at it is this. I wasn't there when it happened. I, I don't know for sure what happened, but the the point is that that it did happen, and it should never have had happened. Uh, it's not how he died, it's that he died, and why did he die? And yes, it, it's upsetting, but that's how I discovered, so I discovered him as, as the activist after I discovered him as the author and the poet. So that's how I learned about medical cannabis. I didn't really know much about cannabis at all before this, um, and that's how I got into that. You know, it's amazing to me is I met you last April, April 20th, uh, yes, also sir. known as That was as my first speaking, yes, my first time speaking about Peter, yes. Not only that, but you're speaking on the lawn right behind the White House. Yes, and uh, you and I are going to be there again this year. I'm very honored that we will see each other there again. Yes. That's right. And those of you out there who are interested in joining us on 420 in Washington, D.C., you can check us out on overgrowthegovernment.org. On the web, we will be at the Sylvan Theater, which is just to the southeast of the Washington Monument, south of the White House. And it is a outdoor theater. It will have lighting and sound and all those wonderful stuff. We have Julia coming to speak. We're very fortunate to have her again this year. Um, I will be speaking. We've got Sean Donegan. He was a DEA uh, information analyst. And then we have a whole bunch of other people coming to talk, but it's not just talk, folks. It's some wonderful music, entertainment, giveaways, and who knows, you may be surprised at who shows up as a guest. That was a wonderful plug, and if you don't mind me plugging, um, also in Maine, I'm going to be speaking about Peter. Uh, Tell us about that, please. April 15th. Oh, yes, yes, it's the weekend of April 15th, the 14th and the 15th. You can go to MaineExpo.com. Mr. Fowler is having me speak there um, at Canamania, and um, and also I'm telling you guys first that Mr. Paul Stanford has invited me to Hempstock later in the year. Fantastic! <laughs> Thank yes, you, Paul. Yes, you wanted to say hi to Dennis, but Dennis isn't here, so. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll call Mr. Dennis Stanford. and and say hi for Paul. <laughs> Paul, thank you oh, very good. much for that. Paul is actually. <laughs> Paul comes by uh, Denver every once in a while. We, we get the rare opportunity when he comes through to see him. And uh, they actually rent out, the THCF, his foundation, um, rents out a space right next door to us, probably about six feet away from me right now. Wow, that is so cool. It is cool. This is, I, such, a, <laughs> this is such a tight community. I love how we all are, you know, we are all over the United States, but we do come together. Yes, I, I would hope that more of us come together, you know, and there's a lot of fighting that doesn't need to happen and that, that we can just be in peace with each other. I know a lot of us disagree on different things, but I see a lot of, I just really hope that we can come together because, you know, it's important if we're going to have a full repeal of prohibition that, that we come together. Julia, um, you really I'm hit on, excited. you hit on a big mm-hmm. one there. Julia, thank you much. <laughs> you, you really, you bring a lot to the table here. Thanks for, for being oh, with us. You. But you, thank you, so you bring much. up the unity thing, the unity part of all of this. And it does, it's oh, going to yes, take all yes. of us together to make this work. We're, you know what, folks? If you guys want to fight, fight later on when we win this battle first. But uh, we're not going to yes. win the battle uh, or this, this war, this war on drugs that has to be defeated. Uh, we're not going to win this. We're not going to get repeal, not legalization. We need repeal. Uh, but we're not going to get that unless we work together. So uh, oh, yes, thank definitely. you. You know, you bring up you bring up a very compassionate side to this story. Um, I've heard a couple people or not heard, but I've read here and there that people have made snide comments. There have been pe- pro- prominent people in the industry who've made rude remarks about Peter McWilliams. And um, it bothers me. And I know it bothers you. And you've you've confronted a lot of this. Um, how do you handle people who don't understand who Peter is or are confrontational or have a different viewpoint, but yet we're all trying to move toward the same thing. How do you deal with those people? 
Wow. Well, fortunately, I don't know about you, but I haven't had a lot of that happen to me. Um, most people that come to me have told me that Peter has either saved their lives or changed their lives for the better. I had a man the other day that was suicidal mm. and who almost killed himself. And, um, and he told me that Peter and the work that I'm doing has just changed his life and saved it. So, goodness, I think on the most part, it's been very positive because Peter was a very positive man. And yes, he was very passionate and I hear he was very colorful. Mm -hmm. You know, he was very outspoken and he might've rubbed people the wrong way at times, but don't we all, I mm -hmm. mean, none of us are perfect. And, and um, it's just, none of us are perfect. I mean, but I mean, he had these great things that he had to say. I mean, he, he said something like uh, ab about, you know, let me, if I could quote him, fill your life with people who applaud your positive thoughts, feelings, and actions, who encourage you toward more and better, who know how to praise the good and beautiful. I mean, that was Peter McWilliams. That's beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and he came from so much pain. He went through so much stuff, and he always tried to rise above it and help other people with his writings. I mean, if it wasn't writing about computers, then it was poetry, then it was how to survive the loss of a love. I mean, he helped so many people, him and his co-authors, Harold Bloomfield and Melba Kogel, they both, all three of those people, they helped so many people. That book is still out today, and it's helping people with their depression and moving on from bad things. And that's the Peter I know, and that's the pe you know, Peter the most of these people I've encountered know. It's amazing. Now that, I know some, oh, it, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, no, sorry, it's okay. It's just amazing how you can really get to know somebody without ever meeting them. But based on his writing and his contribution to um, our world, both creatively and then also in terms of uh, health, uh, he's brought oh, a yes, lot to I us. Mean, yes, I mean, I, I'm really fortunate in that I've been gifted some of his personal journals and diaries. Oh, wow. In which, yeah, and if you go to PeterMcWilliams.org, which is my site, they're all up there, and you'll see it all in his handwriting. And um, these will never part with me. Uh, they will go to the grave with me, but I want the world to know who Peter was, and so I share them. You're the carrying a piece of blessing. history for all of us. Thank you very much for that. That's really important. <laughs> well, I just thank the world for Peter. I'm just really glad that he came along. I think we need more Peters in this world and less hate. I agree with you. That is a big one. Um, I, I think that that is why this industry is moving forward. All of us are very adamant people. We don't take no for an answer. Um, unfortunately, that also brings a lot of conflict just between people. But I think, honestly, there is that love, that compassion, that personal relationship that does exist, even though there is conflict. And honestly, it would be boring if we didn't have conflict. If we all agreed on stuff, what would we be doing? Sitting around, just kind of, yeah, I agree with you. I love you. I mean, that's awesome. It's great. But... Um, and don't get me wrong, I think that would be really cool. But honestly, I appreciate the, and I don't mean the violent conflict, but I mean the conflict with beliefs and emotions and the way we do things. That's where we learn from each other. Uh, it's how we make yeah. our communities better. Um, I definitely don't agree with the violent escalation that takes place nowadays across the globe when conflict arises. It's like, Nobody wants to talk. It's like, all right, I'm just going to go ahead and point my nuclear weapons at you kind of thing. And we see that yeah. happening with Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, um, and we can go down that list. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal occurrence. But that said, people like yourself, people like Dennis Perrone, Harvey Milk, Peter McWilliams, Robert Randall, the list goes on and on and on. It's all of us that are bringing that love back to the, the bigger picture. The communities are seeing it. We're seeing the response. We're seeing people gravitate towards that. So what can you, yeah. Julia, what can you share with us or share with the listening audience about what they can do to bring us together and to try and step past that conflict and move towards, like you said, you know, we can't afford, or the title of, of uh, Peter's book, we can't afford a negative thought. We the luxury can't. of a negative thought, yes. It, or the luxury of a negative thought. And, you know, I think it's it's important for you to bring that up. For me personally, I've really started to bring that into my life. Not started. I've been doing this for a couple of years now, and I am so happy. I have less than I've ever had in terms of the normal, you know, nine to five 
lifestyle, the big house, whatever, but I am happier than I've ever been. And that's yes, because... Yes, wrote about that, yes, yeah. what true wealth is, yes. It's given. He wrote a book called Wealth 101, and in that book he said exactly what you're talking about, that wealth isn't always about money. It's about being happy with who you are and where you are. And that's something I see in you, Julia. Uh, and you bring up oh, that. Wow. You bring up that um, that being shy uh, that you you think you see yourself as. But I see. Well, no, I actually am very shy. Um, people don't realize how much I go through to like prepare for even this radio show. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to like go over quotes over and over and over, and and I, I just people just don't understand. And I think some people don't understand in the community. They're like, wow why don't you smoke pot? And I've actually gotten flack for that from a few people like, oh, you're not, you're not one of us. And that's no, that's not right. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and I tell them, I said, you know, I might not partake, but I take part. And I would like to think that the work that I'm doing is enough to show that you don't have to partake to take part. And what a um, great phrase. I made that up myself. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <I just> snort. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I snort when I laugh, so. <laughs> can, you know what? Can I, I'm going to ask you to do, do me a favor after we finish this show because you've got a great voice. Your energy oh, really carries across um, Thank you. automatically. And Thank you. I, think, I think now I'm seeing something and I need to uh, recognize what you're telling me. And that is, a lot of times I hear this from people outside. They say, you know, you don't look this, that, or the other. You don't yeah. seem disabled. You don't seem shy as I just did to you. And what I've realized is is um, that actually can feel kind of yucky um, when someone says that to you. Because it's like, well, you know, just let me be who I am. Who cares what you think, you know? Um, well, yes, it's like it's like things that are invisible that happen. That's like a brain mm-hmm. injury. People look at you and say, oh. You look normal or something. Right. And they just, they think, oh, well, you know, you don't look like you're brain damaged or whatever. And it's like, uh, you don't know. And it's like when I tell people I'm shy, they're like, oh, come on, you're not shy. Anyone that can get up, up on stage is not shy. But you look at someone like, oh, I don't know, someone that, some big performer, a lot of big performers will tell you that they're extremely scared of doing it. And mm-hmm. I am too. And that, Peter helps because he believes, you know, um, in, you know, fear is something to move, be, move through, not to be turned from. Yes. Like, that's it's, one of his quotes. It's and, an opportunity. It really is. Well, yes. Yeah, so you know, and once I start to speak, like when I speak to you, I, I feel less shy because I'm so passionate about what I believe that I kind of forget about me because it's not about me. People are like, oh, why don't you put your photo up everywhere? We want to see you. You're pretty and all this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not about me. It's about Peter. Yeah, and exactly. that's what I've always wanted. Yeah, when I had the MySpace page for an entire year, I think people, most people thought I was a guy. And, and, I remember and seeing those quotes, I actually, yeah. Too. And then, and then they, see, they say, oh, you're actually a girl. <laughs> And a beautiful one at that. It's funny. I, I have noticed that. And and you have um, a, a lot of people who support you. Um, yes. There's and I hope yeah. it's I hope it's okay. Can I can I mention uh, one of the the people I've been talking with recently um, who also came out to the event? Is it okay to give him a little shout out? Sure. Um, I won't say, mention his last name, but Jerry, thank you so much for what you do as well. Um, it's you you are you're a phenomenal man, and I hope uh, I hope I get to see you this year uh, in D.C. Yes. That is, that is awesome. Jerry, Jerry is a good man. He really is. But I am very fortunate to have met so many nice people, so many nice people, I mean, that really care about Peter and, um, you know, care about me, me being allowed to get the, the message out. I mean, it's amazing. Um, I, I think one of the biggest thrills was last year at um, the Seattle Hemp Fest for mm-hmm. their 20th anniversary. They, they, they allowed me to speak on... The memorial stage for Peter. And, and you played your guitar, too, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. But it was just really a wild experience because I felt Peter on that stage. That's powerful. Wow. Yeah. That's yes. interesting. I feel Peter every time I speak about him, though. I feel that he's here. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sure and he you, is. you believe that, too. I, I, you know, 
we talked about this a little bit earlier before we started to record this, and I agree with you. Um, I think that people are with us. Um, I joke around a lot with um, with my dog and my my service <laughs> dog, and I always say, you know, you were you were a human before, and she always looks at me and she tilts her head, and and oh, wow. and and to me, when she tilts her head, it's saying yes. She does that when she wants to go outside. Hey, you want to go outside? Yes, and she tilts her head, and. Um, when I say that to her and I say, well, you're, you know, you're, you're somebody that, that I knew and I get that, that feeling, you know, it's not that spooky chill, but it's that comfort, <laughs> that support and that acknowledgement. Um, that said, I do believe in universal consciousness. I do believe that energies are always present, whether, you know, in a different form or not, but we don't die. Our body may, may disappear, but that consciousness, that existence, that, that frequency or whatever it is, is still there. Maybe we can't see it. Um, we can't necessarily touch it, but we feel it. Yes, it is, it is there. Um, it really is there. And um, oh, speaking of shout outs, I wanted to shout out to Mr. Marco Renda. Um, I'm very excited that she is allowing me to speak about Peter for 30 whole minutes. Can you believe it? at the Treating Yourself Expo in Toronto. I don't know if you guys are going to make it out Marco, there, but... thank you so much, man. You're an awesome bro. <laughs> He's so nice. Yeah, you are. He's a nice man to me. Marco, you are awesome, man. I wish I came out to the event last year uh, up in Toronto. I'm sorry I missed you guys. Can you go this year, Jason? I don't know if I'm going to be able to get up there. Um, oh. It's funny because uh, I'm sorry. I can't remember your name right now. You can go ahead and call me, and, and uh, you can you can say you know, bad, bad, bad for not remembering. But um, <laughs> there's a woman here in Denver who's uh, contributing right here for treating yourself. And she just contacted me the other day. I hope to meet up with you oh, soon. Goodness. So it's a yes, small I mean, world. Marco, Marco is so cool. I mean, he's letting me speak about Peter and he's even letting me be at his main booth. That's and, like, awesome. With, yes, isn't that awesome? And he, he's just so cool. So do, um, <laughs> do you mind shouting out the dates of the treating yourself event? Oh goodness! Okay, my uh, I gotta remember with my brain. It's I think it's the weekend of May twenty fifth. It's the weekend of Memorial Day weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend. Okay, great. And it's treating yourself expo. dot com. And um, he's also gonna have a story about Peter in that latest issue of Ty. I was just like, Marco, you're so cool. Nice, Marco. <laughs> you know, it's really. I could go on and on about Marco, so I'll shut up now. But yes, he's really wonderful. And um, marijuana. dot net just did a story about Peter today too. I thought that was great. You so know, go check that out. That go care. check that out. Marijuana. dot net. You've got a lot of yes, support. Sir. Peter's got a lot of support. I know that um, it can be a little tough to wade through that crowd out there of the lifestyle yes. stuff, but there's a lot of support for what you're doing. So Julia. Well, yes. Thank you so much for your time. I hope we can have you back on. This has been phenomenal. I'm actually blown away about how fast the time went. I wanted to touch on so many other things. Um, oh, can I leave you with a quote? But I do. I was just about to ask you. I want to leave <laughs> you with um, saying what you would like to share or share with with uh, the audience what, um, what you'd like to share with us. Well, because this isn't about me. This is about Peter, and this is about something much bigger than all of us. I wanted to leave with something Peter said himself, and I quote, In the war on drugs, unlike any war in American history, unlike any modern civilized war of the past two centuries, in this war on drugs, they are not stopping the battle and allowing the Red Cross on the field. In fact, they are shooting directly at the sick and at those who are trying to help them, and they are shooting to kill. And that was from July 4th, 1998, his speech before the Libertarian Party, Peter McWilliams. I think that is enough said, um, that it puts mm -hmm. tears in my eyes, Julia. Thank you very much for sharing that, because uh, this is a war. People are dying, yeah. and you're right. Yeah. This is probably the worst war, because they aren't allowing the Red Cross on the field. There no. is no rules or ethics in this war. This is a terminal war in their mind. And that's why we really need to work together and unify and stand up to this. And um, thank you, Julia, again for coming on today and sharing your story about Peter McWilliams and his contributions to writing, poetry, politics, and really caring about people. 
So you're yeah, that's you're, what it's about in the end. It is. It's about it really humanity. Is. We can make this it's over. Not, it's not about do I smoke or do you smoke. It's mm-hmm. about do I care? Do you care? You know, that's what it should be about. It's about people just loving each other. And if they don't love each other, geez, try to be nice to each other. You know, try to be civil. Choose love. One love, as Bob Marley would say. <laughs> and on that note, we have an event tonight, the One Love event. Uh, and I know this is going to be broadcast tomorrow. And so... Yesterday, I'll say we had this wonderful event that I haven't been to yet, but I'll go tonight. I know that's kind of funny to hear. Anyway, thank you again, Julia, for being on Cannabis Health News Magazine, and we will have you back. And so those thank of you, you out there... Thank you for your wonderful magazine. I know you said you did a piece on him. I didn't see it yet, but I'd like to see that. And I just thank you so much for having me. And Dennis, I know you're out there. I love you, Mr. 